It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Fontas, Fontas Mistropoulos. He is uh, the last speaker uh, for the NetPL workshop, so <laughs> we made it. Uh, so he's the only reason that we're away from uh, beers. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so Fontas is an assistant professor at the University of Crete, and as well as a researcher in Forth, uh, the National Research Institute in, in Greece. Um, so he enjoys very nice weather, but I'm not <laughs> sure about other conditions these days. And also political <laughs> drama. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's heading the Internet Research Group, um, and he's doing research these days in software-defined networking. In particular, he leads a project called uh, Net Pollution. This is an ERC grant, um, where he has this crazy idea that you know, the network control should be delegated and outsourced entirely uh, beyond the network operator themselves. But I don't think this is what you're going to tell us necessarily today. So today, uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about his work on policy compliant path diversity and bisection bandwidth. So without further ado, contest please. Okay, hi, uh, thanks Marco for the very nice introduction. Uh, so hi everybody, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about a uh, joint work with uh, Rohan Clotti, Vasily Kondroni, and Bernard Ager. Uh, and this work comes from uh, ETH Zurich uh, and from University of Crete and Forth. Okay, so let's assume that we are a network operator uh, and we have an autonomous system located somewhere here. Uh, this is the AS topology of the internet and we have some remote critical service that is located in some uh, other autonomous system. Uh, and that uh, we want to know how resilient is our connectivity to this remote uh, auton uh, autonomous system. So uh, a straightforward way to do this is to compute the path diversity between our domain and the remote domain. Uh, and in particular, when we talk about path diversity, we would like to know uh, what limits path diversity. Is it our multi-homing degree that limits path diversity? Should we uh, seek to uh, enrich our multi-homing? Is it perhaps uh, our uh, main provider uh, that has some poor connectivity? Uh, is it maybe the same properties on uh, the remote side or is it maybe the internet connectivity at large it has some uh, maybe limitation uh, and so on? Uh, and to make this example more concrete, uh, let's assume that uh, we have um, a, a source and uh, a destination and we have this topology. Uh, and that we want to compute um, the path diversity in this graph. So you will tell me that uh, uh, a straightforward to way to do this is to compute the mean cut uh, between uh, the source and the destination. Uh, and the mean cut obviously gives us uh, the number of links uh, that um, uh, we need to fail uh, before uh, the connectivity between S and D uh, gets uh, disconnected. So alternatively, we can also compute the bisection bandwidth using a max flow computation, which will tell us how much uh, uh, bytes we can uh, push uh, from the source to the destination. Uh, and further on, we can also compute the number of uh, uh, edge, edge dis disjoint paths between the source and the destination. Uh, and the way to do this is based on uh, max flow mean cut computations. Uh, uh, this is work that dates back uh, from 1956 uh, and, uh, for example, Menger's theorem uh, shows that uh, uh, the mean cut uh, for uh, unitary edge capacities gives us the number of edge disjoint paths uh, between a source and a destination. <coughs> uh, and further on, there are a number of well-known uh, algorithms for doing, for doing this. There is Ford uh, Felkerson algorithm, for example. There is Edmond Scarp uh, algorithm and uh, in general linear programming techniques for solving this, time of, uh, this type of problems. So you will ask me, why do I uh, bother then uh, about this? Isn't uh, all this solved uh, and what is uh, new uh, under the sun uh, in, in this type of problems? So the problem uh, we are uh, facing is that often uh, networks are uh, governed by policies. Uh, and policies uh, limit uh, the number of paths uh, we can take uh, in a network. Um, so uh, policies in general stem uh, from, uh, we can have security policies, 
uh, we can have uh, policies that uh, result uh, from uh, routing uh, optimization and from uh, traffic engineering. Uh, furthermore, uh, we can have uh, policies that uh, result from economic agreements and uh, service level agreements. And to give you an example, uh, a well-known uh, policy uh, uh, of the third type of economic policies uh, is the so-called uh, uh, Valley Free Model of uh, Internet Routing. And just to get an idea how many of you know what is uh, the Valley Free Model? Okay, so about... Uh, <laughs> cool. Okay, so basically uh, the Valley Free model uh, says that um, any path in the internet uh, has a hierarchical structure uh, at the level of uh, autonomous systems. Uh, it consists of uh, one or more uh, customer to provider links as we go uh, up hills. Uh, then at the top of the hill, uh, we can have uh, one peer-to-peer -peer link or there might be uh, no peer-to-peer -peer links. And then uh, we have a downhill segment of one or more uh, provider to customer links uh, until we reach um, uh, the final destination. So we can see it here. Uh, so you can, and this is called the valley free model because it goes up and then it goes down and we don't really have valleys. So this is an example of a policy that, result, uh, that re uh, results uh, from uh, economic uh, uh, relationships between autonomous systems in the internet and enforces this specific structure on, on the paths that we can take at the level of autonomous systems. Uh, but in general we have uh, many different types of policies like waypoint routing that has been uh, mentioned a few times today uh, is another example of a policy. Uh, in waypoint routing we have a source and we have a destination uh, and uh, our network administrator but might require us to go through a firewall or to go through an intrusion detection system. Uh, and these firewalls or intrusion detection systems might be in different points in the network. So uh, we have every time to, to go through there. And then uh, after we go through this checkpoint, routing is free to follow uh, any path we like. So this is another example of a policy uh, that we have uh, on the structure of paths. And of course, we can also have a negative waypoint routing uh, that is the opposite. Uh, we want to go somewhere, but we don't want to go through specific nodes, uh, which are untrusted for some reason. Uh, or we might not trust uh, a specific autonomous system. It might have a poor reputation uh, about the quality, or we might not even like um, the, uh, the legal a framework of the home country of this particular autonomous system. So policies are generally ubiquitous and uh, they, uh, they influence a lot how packets are routed. Uh, and now if we go back to the MinCAT problem uh, and introduce policies, you will see that policies restrict uh, path selection. So let's consider a path, uh, let's consider this uh, example again. Uh, and let's consider that we have two types of edges. We have uh, solid edges and we have dust edges. Um, and let's say that we have a policy that we express like that as a regular expression. So we can have zero or more solid edges. Uh, then we can have one or more dust edges. Uh, and at the end we can have again zero or more uh, uh, solid edges. Then if we compute here the mean cut, you will see that um, uh, in this case, we can take only the two highlighted paths. Uh, and therefore the mean cut uh, reduces from three that was before to two uh, in this case. Okay, uh, so in this work, uh, the contribution is a, a general methodology uh, for computing uh, mean cuts uh, in graphs uh, where basically the mean cut can be expressed as a regular expression uh, on the characteristics uh, of the graph, of, of the path. We assume that, pa that edges uh, have labels uh, and also nodes can have labels, but today in the discussion I will stick into the case that uh, uh, edges have labels. 
uh, and uh, uh, the path that crosses a number of edges uh, uh, is uh, uh, governed by a regular expression uh, on these labels. Uh, and our work is based uh, primarily on a transformation between the original graph uh, and a new graph uh, in which uh, we saw that in the new graph any path is policy compliant uh, and paths that are not policy compliant are not possible in the new graph. Uh, in addition, and perhaps more importantly, uh, we do the transformation in such a way so that uh, we preserve to the extent possible mean cuts in the transformed graph. So if we take a mean cut in the transformed graph, uh, we want it to be uh, uh, equal with uh, the mean cut uh, between the same source and destination in the original graph. Okay, uh, and the uh, nice thing about this approach is that it is based, uh, uh, we do the transformation and after we do the, transfor the transformation, uh, we can use existing algorithms uh, for mean cut computation for computing the mean cuts in the uh, transformed graph. Okay, so this is the summary, uh, and now let's uh, let's delve a little bit into the details uh, and, and try to see how uh, things work. Um, and um, <clears throat> okay, so we have two types of graphs. We have a graph G that represents the network. Uh, and in this graph, we have uh, different types of, ed of edges. Uh, edges carry a label, um, and um, uh, the labels are used to express policies. For example, the label could be the customer to provide the relationship. Uh, it might be the capacity of uh, the link in a switched topology or some other characteristic that, uh, that we defined. And in addition, we have a, a second graph that encodes the regular expression uh, uh, that we uh, uh, that express as our policy as an NFA, a non-deterministic finite state uh, automaton. So this is the graph T here, and it says that uh, we are at state one, and when we cross this edge, uh, the purple edge, uh, we will go at state two. And so let's go back to the uh, example I gave you about the Valley 3 model and let's see how we can encode uh, the Valley 3 model uh, as, a, uh, as an NFA. So the NFA for the Valley 3 model is the one we see right here. Uh, so we have first uh, uh, two states. We have the uphill state and uh, the downhill state. In the uphill state, if we cross a customer to provide the reds, uh, we stay uphill, uh, and, but on the way if we encounter a peer-to-peer -peer or a provider-to-customer edge, then we go downhill. And then in the downhill state, uh, we can cross uh, peer-to-provider-to-customer uh, links and we stay downhill. Also note that uh, uh, the presence of edges uh, encodes allowable uh, transitions, but also the absence of edges uh, and codes transitions that we cannot make. So the core of the transformation is uh, a tensor product uh, between uh, the graph, uh, the two graphs, the graph that represents the network uh, and the graph that represents the NFA and the policy. Uh, and the intuition is that uh, uh, the trans in the transformed domain, in the transformed graph, um, uh, transitions encode both transitions topological uh, uh, in the network as well as transitions in the state, a space that encodes the policies. So this is the tensor product that corresponds to these two uh, uh, input graphs. So we have a node for each combination of nodes uh, in the original, um, in, in, in the two original graphs. So for example, node A1 here encodes that we are at uh, uh, node A and we are at state one. And that if we cross this edge, we will go to node B uh, and we will be at state two. Okay. Um, so now if you look at this simple graph, the mean cut of this graph is just one. So if you look, uh, if you take uh, the mean cut between this set and that set, uh, then it's also one. So and we and we can show that um, all gra all paths in the transform graph are policy compliant. So you might um, so you will ask me 
Uh, so is, is, is this it? Then can we just uh, take uh, mean cuts in the transformed graph uh, and find mean cuts in the original graph? And uh, the answer is no, actually. Uh, uh, and the reason is that uh, uh, in this example, the N phase is quite simple. Um, so let's see here an, another example where we have a more complex NFA. Uh, so in this NFA, uh, we are at state one, uh, and we go uh, either at state two or we can stay, uh, stay at the same state, uh, um, at state one. So now if we take the tensor product between these two graphs, um, then uh, we get this graph uh, where the, the mean cut key here between uh, A and B is two, while the mean cut uh, of this uh, uh, graph is just one. So if you imagine now a graph, a, more, a, a graph that we have different types of labels, and for different types of labels we have different NFAs, uh, then we can get a mix of such mappings as well as uh, uh, a mix of mappings like that. Therefore, if we compute the mean cut on the transformed graph, it can, uh, the mean cut can be uh, distorted uh, by this transformation. The intuition is that uh, uh, we would like the transformation to preserve the mean cut, so to pass the same number of parallel edges uh, in the transformed graph as, as well as with the original graph. So the second idea uh, is to add uh, what we call aggregator states. So instead of having an NFA like that, uh, we represent an NFA with an aggregator state. So we go from the original uh, state to the intermediate state, and then from the intermediate state we go uh, either to one or to two. And this is an epsilon transition uh, from here to there, so it's an untrans is a transition that it does not consume an input symbol. So the tensor product that corresponds to this graph is this one, uh, and the tensor product that corresponds to this graph is the one we get here. So we see uh, that uh, in this case, uh, by adding this uh, epsilon transition and aggregator states, uh, we can uh, preserve uh, the, the mean cut between A and B. Okay, uh, so uh, this is cool, but uh, still, does this uh, hold always? Uh, can we show that it holds always? Um, and uh, in the paper, we saw that it holds in the case that we have uh, NFAs of this type, that we have transitions from one state to another state, from one to many, many to one, and many to many. But then there exists some more complex NFAs uh, for which uh, we saw that uh, uh, we cannot uh, preserve the mean cut. The mean cut is inflated in, in this case. Uh, and if you notice this, uh, the mean cut in pres is preserved in these graphs uh, uh, where basically they are all complete bipartite graph. Uh, and in cases where we don't have a complete bipartite graph, then uh, we have um, a methodology in the paper to decompose the paper, uh, to decompose the NFA, uh, into um, uh, bipartite graphs and use this approximation to compute a, a lower bound as well as an upper bound uh, into the mean cut uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, transformed graph. Okay, um, so uh, basically our methodology, depending on the NFA we have, sometimes will give you an exact mean, mean cut. In some other cases, uh, if we have more complex NFAs, then it will give you uh, lower and upper bounds uh, on the on the mean cut. Okay, so let's go back uh, to the motivating example, to one of the motivating examples, and um, um, let's come here uh, and let's add policies uh, into the game and see how policies affect path diversity uh, on AS level topologies. Okay, and um, we use um, uh, we will compute two, we will compute two policy models, a policy model where we have valley-free routing, as well as a more relaxed policy model where at the top we allow multiple peer-to-peer -peer links to to be crossed the one after the other. On the paper, we also compare a, a case where we don't have policies at, at all, and we can 
uh, use arbitrary paths, but uh, in this case, the path diversity increased by three orders of magnitude, and uh, it's basically not very uh, representative. Okay, so we will compute these uh, policy models, um, uh, and uh, to do this, we use, uh, so this is the classical valet free and the multi peering links policy. Uh, and we use two data sets uh, and also to uh, evaluate the impact of the, of the data set. We use K-AS relationship data set, which gives a, 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 like an instance of the AS topology annotated with customer to provider over peer-to-peer -peer links. However, this data set has the limitation that it misses peer-to-peer -peer links. It's generally known that uh, this data that is collected from BGP, they, they miss peer-to-peer -peer links, especially at internet exchange points. Uh, for this reason, we also use data from PeeringDB, uh, that is a database from, uh, for internet uh, uh, of uh, IXPs and of the members of IXPs. Uh, and based on the data of uh, PeeringDB, we enrich the AS relationship data, data set with peerings uh, between autonomous systems located at IXPs. Okay, uh, and here we saw how path diversity is affected in the different scenarios. So this is a complementary uh, a CDF, um, and uh, the purple, uh, so these are two lines actually. These two lines correspond uh, to the classical valley free model and to valley free model with added peering links from, uh, from peering DB. Uh, and these two lines correspond to the MPL case where we have uh, multiple peering links uh, as well as uh, added uh, links uh, at IXPs. Okay, first of all we see that uh, uh, the impact of the more relaxed uh, uh, policy model is uh, uh, quite significant. If you look at the numbers here, around 20% uh, of the links uh, have uh, uh, four or more disjoint, edge disjoint paths. Uh, and this grows to around uh, 20 uh, if we allow uh, multiple peer-to-peer -peer links. On the other side, uh, adding more peerings at IXPs does not have uh, as significant impact on, on path diversity. So here we see little difference, although uh, uh, here there is some difference that is hidden by the scale, so here the, the, the tail is a little bit longer. Uh, and, and here again, we, we notice a uh, uh, little difference. Okay, so then as a second use case of this uh, methodology, uh, we look at the impact of deep earrings. So ISPs are, uh, especially the last few years, so, but also uh, earlier too, uh, they engage often in uh, so-called peering wars uh, and uh, fights. Uh, for example, uh, a well-known one is the one between uh, Comcast and Netflix. Uh, and these peering wars uh, have resulted in uh, uh, terminating uh, the communication, the peering links between uh, these large ISPs. So here we ask the question, what is the effect of uh, deep earrings uh, in the clients of uh, we simulate a deep peering between two large tier one ISPs, uh, and we ask the question what is the effect of deep peering uh, on their exclusive customer cons, uh, on their customers essentially. And when we say exclusive customers, we only look at uh, customers that are connected either to the one or the other uh, tier one ISP, and we don't look at customers that are connected to, to, to both of them. Uh, and uh, we use um, uh, 10,000 um, uh, randomly selected pairs uh, of uh, uh, customers. Uh, the selection uh, actually is, uh, uh, is, is weighted based on the address space that each of the customer uh, announces. Um, and uh, we measure the impact of deep peering on path diversity in case of the traditional valley free routing as well as in the case of uh, the multi-peering links model. And um, our measurements uh, here indicate that uh, uh, in the case of valley free routing, the impact is uh, 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 much more significant uh, than in the case of the multi-peering link model. Uh, so here we saw a 7% reduction, but here the, um, uh, the path diversity uh, stayed the same. Now, in the paper, we also have some more analysis. Um, 
Uh, we have uh, an analysis of the path diversity between tier 1 ISPs, of the path diversity between tier 1 and tier 2 ISPs, um, and, and so on. Um, I think the most interesting part of, uh, like of the remaining analysis is how fragile are um, the interconnections between tier 1 ISPs, uh, since if, the, uh, um, if you disconnect them, um, then uh, the mean cut between them is, is quite small. Okay, then uh, I will, um, uh, to summarize, uh, so in this work um, we looked at uh, a methodology for computing policy compliant mean cuts. Uh, our methodology is based on a graph transformation based on the tensor product and it can use existing algorithms for mean cut computation. And we look at the cases where uh, policies can be expressed as regular expressions uh, on uh, the structure of the paths. So uh, we, I talked a lot about the use case of valley-free routing, uh, but um, uh, this work uh, is uh, also uh, interesting in different uh, settings. For example, some other uh, settings where it could be used for uh, is to compute the maximum feasible bandwidth for a multipath uh, TCP transfer, so the bisection bandwidth between uh, server clusters when we have policies, or to compute the bisection bandwidth in a data center, or to compute the resiliency of switch topologies to link failures, or the edge, or how much edge capacity should be depleted for a successful uh, DDoS link flooding attack. Okay, uh, and you will ask me how this relates to uh, SDN, um, and the answer is that it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, so these techniques, though, uh, could be used. Um, uh, maybe as part of uh, future work um, uh, by controllers uh, for um, like uh, since you have a more like complete view of the of the network to um, to estimate the res the resiliency of the network uh, in this way. That's actually not true. Um, the, 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 I mean, this how do you avoid like pol policies like this, which is having like you know failure independent paths through the data center network is critically important. So the idea that I have a backup path which no single failure will knock down my primary path or my backup path is absolutely critical. And understanding how they interact with each other would, I mean, I'm not, because the topologies are regular and not discovered, in a, you know, it's an easier problem, but the general idea is clear. I'll be a problem. I'll this. The short version is this idea that you want to go through certain links, and there's other places where you actually want to go share the same links, which is you actually want to, like, if you have two, full, like, like the, the control protocol messages for, uh, for you know, like a SIP voice call and the data and messages for like a SIP voice call, you want them to go on along the same path because if they start having different failure modes, um, it's one of the hardest things to debug known to man um, uh, because like, you know, when your control and your data ends up diverging. And so like, have, and so those you want to follow the same path even though they might be different flows in your SDN network. And you want to make sure they follow the same path. And so this idea that there are certain waypoints I want to go through, or even whole paths I want to use or avoid, is, is comes up a lot in SDN. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand it though, because the data path, um, they're debugged independently, right? So um, take the old days with RTSP and RTP, like in real player, then uh, the control messages are much rarer. It's only when the user interacts. But the yeah. data path is where you just want to do a constant DRS. So if you force them to go into the same peering path, it doesn't really, it's hard to debug, but it, the user experience is just fine, right? If, uh, uh, as long as they both work. Which is like, which is like right. yeah, I mean, which which is. Yeah, but, but, but one not working if my you know, fast forward button doesn't work, but my stream is continuing fine, versus it all fell. Because uh, it both have very different QoS requirements, fundamentally. My, my, my experience in trying to help the, trying to help people debug things like this, especially like, I mean, things like Fiber Channel, which also has sort of control and data right, right. um which is something I actually have spent time with, has just been that like he, any cost which you lose in terms of like you know occasionally having more downtime, mm. you more than get back in the simplicity of understanding the debugging. Uh, yeah, that, that, yeah that, uh, that could be true, but. I mean, it's, but if you can apply cunning language stuff to fix the problem of debugging it, right? <laughs> <laughs> you get all the benefits of having your know, less resilient path. Fair enough. It feels like it's taking your know, once before two steps back to just give up on debugging. And uh, the, so there, there are path. there are cases in which like the functionality of an operation is is 
completely dependent on having two different flows and both complete, in which case you really do want those two flows to have exhibit the same failure semantics, not different failure semantics. Um, and maybe SIP is the wrong example, but there are you know plenty of cases where it is that you want these five flows that should either all fail or all succeed, because having four of the five succeed doesn't help you. I was surprised with the, by the high numbers, so I'm not sure how you chose your ASs to test it, but I guess they're randomly chosen. It's a randomly chosen weighted by the address space that each AS advertises. Well, not, so I would have expected many ASs are just like kind of like client ASs and uh, could randomly choose them and they're not so multi hole so that the bottleneck is really close to the AS, so the cut in some sense. So how, how can you end up with like 103 orders of magnitude higher cuts uh, on average or between like random ASs? You uh, don't look at policies. Long question. Uh, so if you have like a client base, right? Yeah. I guess it's like two or no. So did you say you, you, you weighted them by what? You said you weighted. Uh, them I, I weighted by the address space. Uh, by the address uh, space. Uh, oh, uh, so okay. It's uh, ASC, okay. the selection, uh, the pair of ASCs. Mm. Um, no, that makes sense then. But yeah, I mean, that, that, that would, have, have everything that would drift so. towards yes. higher yes. connectivity. And I guess also, do you have any idea, and this is maybe just the idea for future work, which is um, yeah. um, links in Kata are, are are not always different links, which is like, like and, and I'm not sure what you're modeling at, but like fiber cuts tend to have this property, which is that, so if somebody takes a backload of fiber, it turns out that you have four times less redundancy than you thought you did, because it turns out three of the least lines you bought were actually just released boom, from the boom, same fiber. Um, that's a good point out. And that's, and that's I, I don't have any answers to how you fix that, but I know that it's a problem in practice. Yeah. No, we, we, we discuss this a lot in the paper, that we don't fix that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I, 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 I'm not, I, I, I mean, I don't know that anybody does. I mean, sure, uh, understanding what the customer the is looking at. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I don't know the name. I just know that in practice, like the ability to disambiguate, like it, 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 the knowing the physical fault risk you have along links are actually disjoint is really hard and something which in practice I don't think anybody has good answers for. Short of like what? Sh sh no, I mean what you actually do is that companies like Amazon and Google require that you list the physical fibers that you're sending their least paths across in a way that they can then disambiguate what, what's coming. So, but they have to actually, it's done at a contract level where you can actually then sort it out. So, so what's harder, is it the lack of knowledge or the algorithmic flaw from getting all this data about? Oh, it's just a lack of knowledge. Just, oh, right. People don't disclose. Like, I mean, like, when, when, you, when you buy a link from Verizon, they don't say, and then there's the, there's also sort of, there's yeah. also the, like, one, there's a certain problem which is the layers, which is like, you know, if you buy a link, uh, uh, if you buy a line from Verizon, chances are they're buying it from somebody else, and that can be two or three layers deep. Right. And and all of them have to do their accounting properly for you get to the point where you and the probability that some one of them screwed up and is just lying to you is <laughs> yeah, <it's very laughs> right. So one thing you could do is perhaps use uh, US fiber maps because that would give you perhaps a lower bound on the physical layer redundancy yeah. that you have. Yep. And an upper bound that will come from this analysis. But um, you need the mapping between the physical no, well, not necessarily. You can you can lower bound it. As, I mean, you can upper bound it if you. It can't Map, be any oh, better. Okay, sure. <laughs> the mapping is impossible to find, but the fiber maps are available. They're still pretty tricky. Oh, but there are researchers who are looking. You probably do latency test. If yeah. Roughly, roughly. I mean, you you could then constrain it. If this is this whole you know geolocation thing again. You could then use all the geolocation techniques and <laughs> like say like you can't be using this fiber link because. You're too fast. As it's a very interesting <laughs> measurement problem if you could uh, do that mapping. Yeah, there's actually there's it's just that how do you verify that, which is again applies to many measurements. That, 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 that's worth a lot of money. If, if you can figure out how to tell me whether or not my links are independent, yeah. um, with any probability at all, there's money involved in that. Any <laughs> <laughs> random? <laughs> well, so anything better than chance. Throw a number. Any, any, anything anything <laughs> better than chance has value so right now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this is a, it's money. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's a real, I mean, this is like, if you go talk to like, you know, if you, if you listen to Jeff Dean talk about what a kept takes to keep data centers up, like, it, things like this turn out to be, like, when Google has outages, they're things like this, where it is that they didn't have the data in order to go understand what the risk profiles actually were. Um, that's when the extended outages come from. It's actually cheaper to put down dark fiber than it is to depend on people between data centers. Yes. 
But even even Google uses a bunch of these slides. So. Yeah, that, yeah, everyone has to. Anyway, okay, guys. So let us thank the contest. Thank you. And we should also thank our student volunteers, Jeff Lett and Nicole. Uh, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>